Hello everyone, welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. I'm Joy, this is Athena, and you're gonna see her uh, lizard jump scare here. See the camera focuses on her. She is a 16 year old leopard gecko. Um, I've had her since I was in middle school, so I'm in my 30s now, um, yikes. Um, so uh, this is a video about childhood pets, obviously. I, you know, I've had pets since I was about five years old. Um, so I have a lot of experience with childhood pets because, you know, I'm, I'm one of the recipients of them. And I think about, uh, st statistically speaking, about 80 to 90% of you are as well, uh, maybe more. It depends on where you live, basically, but it seems that it's a very common experience to have animals in your home or even under your direct care as a child. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Is it good for children? Is it bad for children? Is it bad for the animals? Let's find out, right? Um, so I have lots of uh, you know, sources in the description, that kind of thing. Uh, one note before we proceed, you may have noticed I got a new camera. That's because I got a lot of new subscribers. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, you can actually see my hair is flip sides compared to my other videos. You can actually read the text on my shirt. You can see that this is my pygmy hippo shirt. I'm teaching a course about domestication and neoteny today. So uh, you can check that out if you actually get a subscription to the memory school in the description. So check that out as well. Um, let me know if you like the new camera or if I should uh, go back to my phone, which uh, I don't think many of you will. Um, hopefully you can also hear it this one's got a built-in microphone. I may get the clip-in microphone if it's not working, but I like the, the freedom of movement because I like to move my arms and flap them. I have autism, so I'm just gonna <laughs> keep doing that. Wow, the full disclosure here today. Um, let's talk about childhood pets uh, because people have had animals in their lives since the Paleolithic, since at least domestication, possibly earlier. We know that people have had animals in their lives. There's archeological evidence of people keeping foxes as pets and being buried with them in the Paleolithic before the domestication of dogs. Very weird. We also have evidence of people keeping children as people, uh, keeping uh, pets for thousands of years, right? All the way back to like ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and uh, Middle Ages and, you know, China, India, uh, all over the world, basically. Children have been involved in the care and play of pets, right? Um, and animals. And it, this seems to have been a very culturally universal, you know, 80, 90% of you are probably also have pets at home, right? So it's it's something that a lot of people will have, right? And, and so this is gonna be a very touchy subject for probably a lot of you, uh, because we all have a lot of experience with animals from a young age. And I'm sure if you clicked on this video, you, you probably are more statistically likely to have had that experience, right? Um, and you may have children of your own that have pets as well. So you wanna learn more about it, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, the English philosopher John Locke actually had quite a lot to say about the benefits that uh, pets could conceivably have on the moral development of children and their development of empathy. I'm going to read a quote for him. Uh, keep in mind that John Locke liked to talk about both sides of his mouth on issues, so he probably was, I don't know how serious he was about this. Um, he seems to have very conflicting opinions depending on who's, who he's trying to flatter or write for, but this one seems to be kind of his gen genuine opinion about animals and about children, so I'm going to read it here. One thing I have frequently observed in children, that when they have got possession of any poor creature, they are apt to use it ill. They often torment and treat very roughly young birds, butterflies, and such other poor animals which fall into their hands, and that with a seeming kind of pleasure. This, I think, should be watched in them, and if they incline to any such cruelty, they should be taught to contrary usage. For the custom of tormenting and killing of beasts will, by degrees, harden their minds even towards men and they who delight in the suffering and destruction of inferior creatures will not be apt to be very compassionate or benign to those of their own kind. Our practice takes notice of this in the exclusion of butchers from juries of life and death. Children should be from the beginning be bred up in an abhorrence of killing or tormenting any living creature, and be taught not to spoil or destroy anything unless it be for the preservation or advantage of some other that is nobler. And truly, if the preservation of all mankind, as much as in him lies, or everyone's persuasion, as it indeed is everyone's duty, and the true principle to regulate our religion, politics, and morality by, the world would be much quieter and better natured than it is. But to return to our present business, I cannot but commend both the kindness and prudence of a mother I knew, who was wont always to indulge her daughters, when any of them desired dogs, squirrels, birds, or any such things as young girls used to be delighted with. But then, when they had them, they must be sure to keep them well, and look diligently after them, that they wanted nothing, or were not ill-used. For if they were negligent in their care of them, it was counted a great fault, which often forfeited their possession, or at least they failed not to be rebuked for it. 
whereby they were early taught diligence and good nature. And indeed, I think people should be accustomed from their cradles to be tender to all sensible creatures and to spoil or waste nothing at all. Okay, so John Locke has some ideas, and this seems to be uh, commonly accepted wisdom into the Victorian era and into the Edwardian and in our, in our more contemporary periods, right? That having access to animals as a child, having care and responsibilities, having lots of playtime and forming attachments with animals would kind of benefit your moral and intellectual and empathetic development as a child. Is that true? Well, let's investigate more about attachments in children and, and these kind of things with their animals. We know that um, there seems to be a gender kind of bias towards attachments towards animals, that girls are more likely to form attachments to pets than boys. This is an average, there's going to be boys that are more attached, there's going to be girls who are less attached, that kind of thing. Children that are below the age of puberty are more likely to at form attachments with dogs and cats and less likely with other kinds of animals. But you know, teenagers like me would form attachments with little lizards, right? Yeah, there you go. I know, I'm going to show more lizard jump scares, I'm sorry. There you go. Ah! <laughs> She's like trying to move around a little bit. Yeah, anyway, uh, so we know that there's uh, some differences that way. And oldly children are more likely to form attachments with their, um, uh, with animals than children in large families. But of course, there's gonna be a huge amount of variability. Every child is different. We also know that the level of responsibility that children have varies greatly. So they found that uh, there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of strong statistical evidence of this, but there are some indications that children that grow up on farms may have more responsibilities towards their um, animals than children that grow up in cities and in suburban environments, right? Um, and this seems to be part of the ethos or the, the kind of philosophy towards farming that they are trying to engender in their children, they, the parents, basically. Um, but it can also swing the exact opposite way, and we find that parents may be taking prime responsibility for the, the pets that their children own. And this kind of responsibility is often very gendered, so mothers rather than fathers are more likely to step in and uh, feed water and clean up after their pets. And especially male children may expect this, and they may find that their mother, you know, mothering animals is just something that mothers do. Um, so there seems to be a very early kind of learned sort of associations between um, sex and gender in, in, in young boys. Well, surprise, surprise, we're living in a, you know, misogynistic sexist society. A little guy, I know. She's such a cute little old lady, I know. These guys live about 15 to 20 years. I don't know if I mentioned that, but uh, if I'm repeating myself, you know, that's just because I never work with children or animals is what they say in, in videography. I'm a veterinarian. I don't know the first things about making videos, so if my videos suck, let me know. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying my best. I'm, I'm just trying to share information with you that way. But uh, what kind of benefits does owning an animal may have for a child? Well, I think this is such an awkward position. Do you want to walk this way? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so the most obvious and kind of consistent finding is that children that grew up with animals as teenagers are more likely to develop um, uh, a kind of a sense of welfare or responsibility towards animals in general. So they're more likely to become vegetarians and vegans. Check for me, I guess, uh, and they're more likely to uh, join kind of animal advocacy societies, donate to animal funds, um, and just be in general more likely to show empathy and that sort of thing towards animals. Now, empathy in the, in the broad sense, right? There doesn't seem to be a strong kind of um, evidence that animal ownership in general helps the sense of empathy develop, which is interesting. Um, they did a study where they found that the empathy difference between children who own pets and children who don't is about the same uh, for most pets. The only difference they found was a slight difference in that dog owners, typically a dog owner children, typically have a slightly higher empathy than those who didn't own pets, basically. And uh, children who own cats is actually slightly less. Um, they don't exactly know why. The idea might be that um, children prefer dogs um, if they're highly empathetic, and they may prefer cats if they're not. Uh, maybe. Um, the difference is so slight that it may just work out in the wash with repeated stuff. A lot of the stuff I'm saying is social science, and I don't want to be one of those STEM lords that's like, well, well, you know, social science is a real science. I think it's a real science. I think that we can learn stuff from it, and that it's at least worth knowing the limitations. And um, humans are complicated, and I have a lot of sympathy for people trying to work in these kind of fields because I learn a lot from this stuff. And you know, if you're if you're into the STEM stuff, you should you know, the humanities are important for you too. Um, we also know that uh, 
Animals can be helpful for anxiety as well as self-esteem in children, so they can help make them more calm and less likely to have mental illnesses overall. But that uh, benefit is kind of put through the wash if that animal dies at a young age, right? Now these animals, you know, she can live 15 to 20 years, but your average rat lives like, what, two to three years at best? Um, mice, it's like one to two years. You know, hamsters, another two to three years. You know, guinea pigs, like four to eight. You know, rabbits, nine to 12 with good care. Um, <laughs> and dogs and cats, it's like, you know, what, 15 or so? Um, that means that these animals could die at a young age. Um, either due to natural causes, or due to accidents, or disease, or, you know, neglect or abuse, right? Like, and that, some of that could be from children or from the, the parents, that kind of thing. And that can be traumatizing for children. They found that children that have lost a pet before the age of eight were more likely to develop mental health problems than children who still had their pet um, at uh, the age of eight, basically, or, or later. So, early childhood loss leads to mental health problems I, so obviously there is there's some kind of obvious stuff that way but the idea that children should experience loss at a young age was something I thought was kind of like oh yeah the, you know the pets prepare a child for loss and this is an important aspect of it maybe not so maybe it's better that they don't have these kind of things that it seems that there's no statistical difference between childs that uh, have lost their pet before the age of eight and those who child who never had uh, a pet basically so who knows um, there's also some evidence that there could be immunological benefits to owning dogs in particular uh, for, for young children. So if they grew up with a dog in the household, they're much less likely to have um, atopic dermatitis, which is like eczema, asthma, or um, hay fever signs, right? Um, now, this may be from the dogs themselves. It may also be from the pollen and dander that dogs bring in because they found no benefit with cats. It is statistically the same. Um, and uh, Immunology is very complicated, and we don't exactly know what causes the development of allergies. It seems to be environmental. I made a whole video about, like, dog allergies, because I'm, I'm a veterinarian and more interested in dogs and cats. So you can check that out as well if you want to learn more about kind of allergies as well. Um, with the kind of drawbacks, I've already mentioned, like, the fact that loss can affect children greatly. The responsibility of taking care of an animal can put a lot of, you know, strain and pressure on a child, which can be very bad. Children often have a very different sense of what care looks like than, than adults. They often distinguish, they don't distinguish care and play. And that uh, children often see that play is a form of care because parents play with their children. They think kids, they like that. And kids play with each other. That's how they show care for each other. Um, but the actual kind of monotonous chores of feeding, watering, and a cleaning after them can be a lot. There's also physical risks, and I don't think those should be neglected. So, the obvious ones would be allergies. A lot of children have allergies to dogs and cats, as well as to like rabbits and, and birds and all sorts of different things. And that can often lead to rehoming situations or that kind of thing where they have to get rid of the animal. And so that may not be good for the animal's welfare either. Um, there can also be issues with zoonotic diseases. And one of the big ones would be raw food diets in, in dogs and cats. I made a video about that. But things like ringworm, which is actually a, a fungus called dermatophytosis, um, it can be very uh, um, lower the quality of life of the child, even enough it's not that dangerous. But more severe things too, like cat scratch disease, which is Bartonella. Yes, cat scratch fever is a real thing. Uh, <laughs> there's also your um, uh, more serious things like rabies, and often dogs transmitting rabies to children is very, very common, especially outside of the, the Western world where we basically eliminated dog rabies. You could see my video about that. Um, but there's also the physical risks of injury from the animal itself. So cats can scratch and bite, and dogs can bite. And, and actually, for children, the one of the most common causes of ER emissions is dog bite injuries. In children younger than the age of eight, it's usually the dog at home. Um, children older than the age of eight are kind of more exploring around, and they may be attacked by unfamiliar dogs. But especially children under the age of six that get dog bite injuries, they're often to the head, neck, and thorax. Um, that means that these children could often receive life-threatening injuries um, and even die from dog attacks and dog bites. A lot of people don't know the signs of dog aggression or they don't see the things kind of developing beforehand or they may not recognize the danger that's involved. And so I think that there are dangers to owning pets for young, fam uh, you know, ch young children and families, that kind of thing. And that can pose a lot of risks and a lot of drawbacks, which obviously do not outweigh the benefits of having animals around. 
That said, you know, I grew up with animals since like, you know, I've had little budgies, I've had uh, rodents, I've had dogs, I've had um, uh, fish, I've had, and I, I own rabbits now, but I had rabbits as a kid. Um, what about the welfare of these animals? Well, there's not been a lot of studies about this, and I think part of it is that it takes place in private life, and studying things that happen in private life can be very tricky. These social scientists are often using like um, uh, surveys, and a lot of people don't know if they're neglecting their animal out of ignorance, or they just they won't report it if there's neglect or abuse at home. And uh, the criminological aspects, they're only looking for the bad guys, they're not looking for the good guys that are taking good care of their animals. But there's also an aspect I think we just don't want to know um, about how badly animals have it. And a lot of um, exotic animals in particular are often neglected, they're often abused, and you know, by children, by adults as well. Um, they often don't know the needs of these complex reptiles, you know. They need a special kind of UV setup, uh, heat, um, they need to have be kept in a specific temperature range, they often need live food, um, they need to have specific environmental conditions, which a lot of people just don't know about. And if a child doesn't find that out in their preliminary research and the adult doesn't care, that animal could live a very short or unhappy life. One of the papers that I linked in the description talks about this, and they recommend that in general um, reptiles, birds, and uh, those kind of, and a lot of cage pets should not be kept at all. And I don't know if I exactly agree with that kind of more um, extreme statement, but there definitely needs to be a lot more education about what these animals need. Um, and uh, people need to be aware that these aren't good pets for children. And that I don't think there should be a pet that's specifically for children, right? Like rodents and that kind of thing. Just because they have a short life doesn't mean they don't deserve a good life. Um, they deserve all the same kinds of things and welfare needs that other kinds of animals do, especially because their lives are so short and so uh, fraught with danger and that kind of thing. That if we can provide good things for their life and give them a happy life, we've done good by them, right? Um, so, you know, I think there, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons about this, and I think that I can't tell you how to reproduce your own family. That's your job. I'm sorry. I don't really know children. I don't know the adults that well. I don't know families that well. But I do know animals a little bit more. And I think that there can be pros and cons to owning an animal. And I think we need to be aware about the risks, both to the child and to the pet, about these kind of relationships. But with good kind of parental guidance and uh, good research beforehand and maintaining the husbandry standards, it could be a good dog time for everyone. And uh, I think that that's one of those complex things. I think it's a little bit more nuanced than what John Locke says, and I think that we all need to kind of keep that in mind. But, uh, you know, for me personally, it got, you know, keeping animals like Athena here, let me say hi one more time, she actually helped me, um, you know, get interested in uh, animals. It got me my zoology degree and um, got me in my career in animals working as a veterinarian. So, you know, maybe childhood pets aren't that such of a bad thing after all, uh, and that we could all you know, have a few more animals in our lives. Okay, I ranted for a long time here. Um, that I kind of wanted this to be a shorter video. It's going to be like 20 minutes long or something. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you like the new camera. Um, so just comments in there. I'm going to probably make some longer videos here once I'm done my course this summer. Um, but uh, it may be a little bit spotty for the next couple months here while I'm sorting things out. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed. And if you didn't, well, I'm going to delete your comments anyway. I know. <laughs> I'm the tyrant, so, you know, uh, uh, peace, and uh, take care, everyone. Peace.